you guys, you guys are the good students. Yeah. Yeah, you guys make up the top section of the class. So nice work. Now we know why. So you actually know stuff. All right, are you recording that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, today we're going to just cover our reverse osmosis and uh, we're going to get into disinfection. So, you have new slides uploaded um, for disinfection. We'll get into that a little bit. First thing, though, the water song was by Adele and by Clint Black. I'm sure they know each other. And the water joke is a text that I got from a student last year. He <laughs> just texted me and he's, <laughs> he's like, check this out, Dr. Ladner. It's the, it's the water bottle monster. <laughs> I get a chuckle every time I look at that. I'll pull it out sometimes and just look at it to brighten my day. Because <laughs> it's cool, like the mom, you know, has her nice, sweet little daughter on her back, and she's just like, ah, <laughs> give me water. Okay. All right. Any questions from last time or anything? Working through the um, through the rest of the the um, <coughs> figures. Go okay? Yeah. Figured it out once you got the fluxes and all that. Okay. Good. All right, so reverse osmosis and nanofiltration here. We're going to finish this up today. And this is our review right here. Going through. And we left off with this last problem. Oops. We started, where did it go? There it is. So this is similar to problem 6, 8 in your book. How much, how much water can we produce if we have a 5 by 3 by 2 array system? Okay, so you have that in your slide. And we succeeded in drawing this diagram last time. And we just want to remember that this is the first stage. This would be the second stage. This is the third stage. And it looks just like a crazy diagram, but the key is to remember that it's the concentrate that goes to the next stage. The permeate only goes you know, once it leaves, then you mix all the permeate together from the different stages, and that's, that's good. There are some cases where you might treat the permeate twice. It might go through a two-stage system, um, but that's pretty rare. Most of the time, this is what we're doing, like this. And then the other, um, so working through this problem, we knew that we had 5,000 meters cubed, was it per day? I'm gonna pull out my notes here. All right, so yeah, 5,000 meters cubed per day total. And so we're going to divide that evenly among all of them. So we've got 1,000 meters cubed per day, 1,000 meters cubed per day, 1,000 meters cubed per day. All right, for completeness, we'll write it all out. 1,000 meters cubed per day. OK, now your job is to figure out how much are we going to get in each of these flows how much flow is going to go to the next stage and the next stage. And the criteria that they give is you can only have a certain amount of flow going to each stage. So for example, if I decided I'm going to do a 5 by 2 array, that might not work because it might be too much water for the two elements to handle. And then conversely, like if I do a 5 and then another 5 array, that might be too little water. You know, we gotta get we gotta get a balance there between too much water and too little water, and so that's why this, that's why we can design this. And we gotta know are two elements or two uh, pressure vessels good for the last one, or do we need more or fewer? Okay, so that's what we're gonna. We'll do so the first thing, let's see. So this is the concentrate, and this is the permeate. We also want to know like how concentrated will the concentrate be, and uh, how clean will the permeate be. We're going to use this equation that we saw in the slides. Recovery is QP <coughs> over QF, and that's going to be 0 0.45. Now remember, let me draw this 
draw this out a little bit here. Each pressure vessel is really long. All right. And so what we're saying is that the recovery, the permeate flow rate coming out of the inside tube here, this is QP, and then the uh, concentrate actually comes out of all this, QC. And remember that like the, the permeate, the permeate pipe is in the middle, so the feed is going into the sides here. So this is QF. And you can actually set this up to where the permeate water can come out both ends. It just depends on the manufacturers, how they like to design their systems, whether the permeate all comes out at the other end, or maybe it all comes out this end. It just depends on your plumbing. But so this, this could have QP coming out this way. But this is the pressure vessel, okay? So inside the pressure vessel, we have, we have the membrane elements or the membrane modules. And so I'm going to draw, in this case, I'm just going to draw four elements, all right? And these would have connectors somehow. Well, the connector would kind of go around everything. But I'm going to just show the connections between the permeate pipes. All right, so the clean permeate would be connected from element to element. And uh, the concentrate just continues flowing through each of these uh, RO modules. So we've got to realize that if we're getting 45% recovery for the whole pressure vessel, then that means we're getting less recovery here. If it's 45 total, we're getting something, <coughs> something like 4.1 recover. I'm, I'm sorry, 10.1 uh, percent recovery here. Another 10.1 percent recovery there. 10.1 percent recovery there. 10.2 percent recovery if we were just to average it all out. <coughs> In reality, though, the recoveries are a little bit different. Why do you think that is? Why do we not get the same recovery in, in every element that, uh, you know, just divide it all by, divide the total recovery by four? Mm. Man, Fridays are worse than Mondays, huh? All right, Michael. Is it because there's a different water quality going through each vessel? Okay, why? <clears throat> You're taking stuff out of each. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're getting, we're taking clean water out of the system right here, right? And it's dirtier water going to the next one. So if this came in at something like uh, 8,000 milligrams per liter concentrate, then the concentrate that goes to the next one is going to be something like 9,000 milligrams per liter and uh, 10,000 milligrams per liter and 11,000 milligrams per liter in the concentrate. And we know that our flux is delta P minus delta pi over mu R M. And this delta pi is directly proportional to the salt concentration. So as the salt concentration goes up over time, delta pi goes up over time, that means this gets smaller, this term gets smaller and flux goes down. Now another interesting thing is the, the pressure. Here we have the highest pressure, but we know from fluids, maybe you guys that are in fluids right now have already talked about this, but as you have flow going through a, a pipe, you always have to have less pressure at the end than you did at the beginning. So if it starts at 800 PSI right here, then it's you know 750 right here, 725, 700 or so, get it to the end. So it's kind of a double whammy. Our concentration is increasing, which increases our osmotic pressure, and our pressure is decreasing, and so overall our driving force is decreasing and our, and our flux is decreasing. Jason. How do you get the percent flow rate? That was just given to us. So for, for our design problem here, we're just saying that uh, the manufacturer has told you that their pressure vessels, op they work in this manner. Okay. In reality, it would, it would vary, and that's kind of what I'm talking about here, just the, the caveat. All right, so that's important, an important thing to realize when we get into the actual uh, design. We're not going to do detailed calculations of how the pressure changes and how the, um, 
how the osmotic pressure in increases over time, but just conceptually we've got to understand that that's happening. And I think a good conceptual question will be why, why can't you make the pressure vessel longer? So what's the answer to that? Why don't, like if we need better recovery, why don't we just make the pressure vessel longer, right? Because we had, you know, we had good recovery here. Oh wait, what I'm going to say is um, we should, in reality we're going to have something like 17% recovery here, maybe 15, maybe 14% uh, recovery here, maybe this goes down to the 10% recovery, and this goes down to like 6% recovery, okay? So we scratch those averages out, and we know that our recovery is actually decreasing. So why can't we make the pressure vessel longer? You'll get it less, uh, you'll come out less by the end because exactly. we don't have enough pressure to push it through the membrane. Right, and uh, there are consulting firms that, that uh, in the early days of reverse osmosis, some people started paying close attention and realizing that in some RO systems, people were getting 0% recovery at the end, and in fact, the end only served to add salt to your permeate because you'd have a reversal of flux and salt would be leaching out of your concentrate into your permeate and just making the water quality worse. So they would do this analysis and, and help people realize that you can't, uh, can't push your system too far. Okay? Now if we start over though, if we take this one and then we, and we take all the concentrate water and send it to a second stage and maybe in between these stages we have a booster pump to increase the pressure, then we can start getting the recovery we need. But, but inside all one pressure vessel, it's not going to work well. Okay. If I can remember, that's probably going to be a conceptual question on the exam. What's the problem with making it too long? There's two problems. Concentration increases, so your osmotic pressure goes up, and the, pre the, the actual applied pressure decreases. So those are the two problems that happen. Okay, let's continue with the example here. We want to figure out our recovery, and we're just to make it simple though, we're going to assume that the recovery is 45% in all of these stages. To achieve 45% in the second and third stage, we had to increase the pressure, um, but we're going to assume that we did that. So we're going to figure out QP first stage. I'm going to just call it 1ST. QP, 1ST, ST means first stage. So that's going to be 5 times 1,000 meters cubed per day times 0 0.45. And then let me erase this stuff over here. <coughs> Solve it for the flow rates here. What is the permeate coming out of the first stage? It's going to be 2250 meters cubed per day. All right. QC first stage is going to be the same or a similar kind of calculation. Five times a thousand meters cubed per day times 0 0.55, and that's 27. 50 meters cubed per day. Notice all we did, we said the percent recovery was 0.45, and uh, so that's 45% of the feed. That means all the rest, the concentrate, had to go the other direction, and that was 55% of the feed went into the concentrate. So there's got to be a mass balance. We can't generate water and we can't lose water. We know that the permeate plus the concentrate has to equal the feed. All right, so QF, second stage, we got to solve for QF. QF for the first stage was given to us in the problem, but now we got to know what is QF for the second stage, and that's just going to be 2750 meters cubed per day. Really, we did solve for it already because we know the concentrate from the first stage is the feed to the next stage. But we're going to say 2750 divided by 3 meters cubed per day per vessel. Okay. 
and so that's 916.7 meters cubed per day. And the reason we had to calculate that was to figure out whether it meets our criteria. And I don't remember exactly what the criteria were. Let me look on the screen here. We said that the flow for each pressure vessel must be between 750 and 1,000 meters cubed per day. We're at 916, so we're between 750 and 1,000. We know we're okay. So three pressure vessels is a good number to use. All right. Now we solve for QP of the second stage. And that's going to be 3 times the 916.7 meters cubed per day times 0 0.45. And that equals 1,238 meters cubed per day. And QC from the second stage is going to be similarly 3 times the 916.7 times the 0 0.45. 5 meters cubed per day, and that's 1,513 meters cubed per day. Okay? <clears throat> now we can solve what's the feed for the third stage. That's our 1513 meters squared per day over 2, because we have 2 vessels in the third stage. 756.5 meters cubed per day per vessel, per pressure vessel. And again, our criteria was that it had to be between 750 and 1,000, so we're, we're within specs. We we're close to the top of the range for the second stage. We're close to the bottom of the range. We're close to the 750 for the third stage, but it, it is there, so that's good. Okay, and the permeate from the third stage is 2 times 756.5 meters cubed per day times 0 0.45, and that equals 680.9 meters cubed per day. So the total permeate then. I'm going to add three numbers together. Which, which three numbers? Looking at your notes on the board, which numbers? Permeate from each stage. Okay, let's permeate from the first stage, Jason. 2,250. 2, Second stage? Uh, 1,238. 1,238. Third? 681. Great meters cubed per day, and so the total permeate then is going to be 4169 meters cubed per day, and the total recovery equals the 4169 divided by the 5,000 feed, that's 0 0.83, so 83% recovery. Okay. This should, this should help us see why we do staged systems. Each pressure vessel can only give us 45% recovery, but in the end, the whole system gives us 83% recovery because we squeeze a little bit out of each one. Notice that the permeate from the first stage was by far and, by far and away the largest volume. But the second stage gave us a good amount, too. The third stage didn't do too much for us. It gave us 681. And that is actually the reason that you don't see too many three-stage systems in, in the industry, either. Because it's going to cost you a good bit of money to install that third stage, maybe an extra pump, and, and uh, all the equipment and control system that goes with that third stage. So if it's only giving you that 681 meters cubed per day, you got to do the cost calculations and figure out whether it's going to be worth it to operate that third stage. Um, it might be, might be uh, useful in some cases because maybe your water costs are 
really high in general, or maybe you really don't want to have to bring in a lot of water and send your brine out. Actually, the, uh, the brine disposal is going to be a big driver. It's going to cost you money to get rid of that brine. When I say brine, I'm talking about the concentrate. Remember, the concentrate is a higher concentration of salt. So you're gonna to have to send that somewhere. <clears throat> this system would be something that you might see in like a uh, softening plant in Florida or something. There's a lot of hard water in Florida. Instead of lime softening that we talked about, lime softening has a lot of chemical inputs and, and uh, a lot of corrosion problems and things like that. People have been turning toward nanofiltration or like a loose reverse osmosis to achieve softening. When you do that though, you're gonna get your 17% of your water is going to be this highly concentrated salty solution that you have to deal with. So there, that's, those are all the trade-offs on the economics of reverse osmosis and nanofiltration. Your energy cost, your cost of equipment, but then your cost of brine disposal as well. Yes, sir? Why well, couldn't I just put it in like a lagoon or something because it's, it's just like salt? Yeah, well, in some cases they do. They do do that, but the big issue is just uh, it'll it'll leach into the ground, so you have to have that lagoon line very well, and then sometimes we're talking really high flow rates, so the lagoon you know can only be so big, and once you fill it up, that's it. They they do let it evaporate, um, but again, the evaporation rates are a constant, and so you're limited in terms of the, the size you can have that lagoon. Okay. Let's see what else here. Let's see. We've got... Did you want me to do these in sections? So. Uh, yeah, go ahead and make a new section.